Okay, um, let's get started. Um, first of all, any questions uh, about anything from the exam or anything last time? Again, we gave back the exam last time. Some stragglers picked up their papers. If you didn't pick it up, come by it to me after class. Um, any questions about uh, the exam or life or anything like that? Again, if the, the key point, if you did something that was in the 20s or the 30s or the low 40s, that is a problem. And so you have to figure out how to do better. Um, the good news is we are going into a new unit, so it's going to look a little different than what we did before. The bad news is it is probably newer material to many of you. And so many people find it, you know, find it harder, okay? So, um, so if you didn't do as well as you would like, you've got to find ways of, 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 of getting better. Going to the TA recitation, the TA office hours, my office hours to ask questions is good. Um, working harder with a partner to make sure you understand the, 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 the homework problems is good. Um, you know, but uh, it may require beating on it harder. Any questions? Yes? Sorting algorithms will not explicitly be on the next midterm. Um, does that mean I might not ask you to sort something? No. Does that mean I, uh, I'm not going to ask you a, a problem drawn from chapter four, okay, on the midterm? That said, that doesn't mean sorting no longer exists, it, you know, and it will be on, on the final, okay? Any questions? Okay. Okay, the unit that we're now in is on graph algorithms. And uh, the last class, I introduced the idea of, uh, um, you know, what graphs are, why they're important, but also why, um, you know, basically how you represent graphs in a computer. And to do that, I used, uh, I talked about there were two representations. There was the adjacency matrix which was an n by n matrix. And element ij was 1 if and only if the graph had an edge from i to j. That was an adjacency matrix. An adjacency list had a vector, a one-dimensional array from 1 to n, of linked lists. And edge ij would be represented by a node on the ith list that was j and on the jth list that was i. Any questions about adjacency list or matrices when we, uh, before I get started on the problem of the day? Okay, so the, uh, the problem of the day is about very elementary uh, operations you could do on a, uh, w w between graph representations. What would you do if you have a graph, an undirected graph, okay, which is n by m edges, okay? How, how would you, what, what kind of program would you write to convert an adjacency matrix to an adjacency list efficiently? Okay, what does something like this look like? Okay. It should be pretty clear that what you're going to have to do, maybe I'll make this another color, is walk down every column of the adjacency list, adjacency matrix. And whenever you see a 1, that means an edge that's got to be put onto the appropriate adjacency list. Does everybody kind of see that? So what does something like this look like in code? Just as a gross idea, a pseudocode for i equals 1 to j n, for j equals 1 to n, okay, if, uh, you know, m of i j is equal to 1, basically we're going to call the n edge procedure 
IJ to the adjacency list. This is an ed edge thing. Okay. How did we, what, what was the ed edge procedure? Basically, if we were going to be adding edge I to an adjacency list, if this was our adjacency list structure, adding edge IJ started, went to the ith list of the, uh, we had a vector of, point of pointers to linked lists. The ith lists are the edges associated with edge I. We can insert a new cell here, which has J in it as the head of the list. And on the Jth list, we insert a new cell with an I. This should now point to the head of this, and that goes on like that. Any questions about what that looks like? What is the running time of this algorithm in terms of n, the number of vertices, and m, the number of edges? What is the running time? Yeah. n squared, right? And the reason is because the add edge operation took how much time? Every time we added an edge here, it took constant time, right? Because all we did was add, it, add, add two things to the head of their appropriate list. Any questions? Actually, instead of answering, let me now try just to make it simpler. Let's say I wanted to translate an adjacency list representation to an adjacency matrix representation. What would that kind of program look like? Do you see what I want to do? I now want to go the other way around. The problem of the day was a little bit different. It had a, a third option. But the bread and butter things that we're going to use are adjacency lists and maybe adjacency matrices. What does this kind of a pro procedure look like? It is going to look something like, what are you going to do? Probably the first part is going to be initialize the adjacency matrix M, right? We want to go from an adjacency list we're given to an adjacency matrix list. How do we initialize the adjacency matrix? Yeah? Okay, we're going to allocate an N by N slab of memory. How do we initialize it? Yeah? Set it all to zero. Now we've got a matrix that is all zero. Okay? What are we now going to do to cruise through the whole adjacency list structure? The outer thing is going to be a loop. 4i equals 1 to m, n. Now I'm going to start at the start of the list, right? I'm going to probably say that P is equal to, you know, L sub I. Now I've got a pointer at the start of the list, right? And now what am I going to do? I am going to basically go through and say, well, P is not equal to nil. What am I going to do? I'm going to start out by saying, okay, M of I, comma, what P points to dot X is equal to 1. People see what I'm doing. If you don't see it, this is a great time to explain because this is the easiest thing we're ever going to do with these graphs. If we can't do this, we can't do anything. Okay? What is this saying? The first element of this list, what does each element of the linked list have? It has a data field, which I'm calling X, and it has a next field. We want to set I, comma, P dot next to 1. While I'm at it, I might as well set P points to dot X 
comma i equal to 1. And then I should probably say p equals, p points to next. And this is the way that I would copy an adjacency list to an adjacency matrix. Does everybody see what the metaphor is, the uh, basic organism? For each vertices list, cruise down that list. Each entry of the list represents an edge. Set the appropriate cell of the matrix to 1, corresponding to an edge. And since it is an undirected graph, we want to set it the other way as well. Any questions about that? Okay. Now is a good time if you have any questions about this. I'm not going to bother with the incidence matrix from the homework, just because uh, I want to move on a little bit. But does everybody see, see, that, see, see what I did here? And the, the metaphor of for each vertex, cruise through all its adjacent edges. That is the way that you typically deal with adjacency lists. Any questions? Okay. Let me see if I can get rid of this stuff. Bang. No, let me try this. Okay. Oh, good. So what I would like to talk about now is um, the first interesting thing to do with graphs. And that has to be interesting, meaning it's a building block for building more sophisticated graph algorithms. It has to do with taking a graph, a network, and traversing it, making sure you visit every edge and every vertex of the graph. Does walking over the adjacency list like this visit every edge and every vertex of the graph? The answer is, I guess, kind of, yeah. OK? But notice it does it in kind of a funny, jumpy way. It takes vertex 1, and it visits all the edges. And then it teleports to vertex 2 and visits all the edges, right? That's what this is doing. It's not walking through the graph in a kind of systematic way. Traversal is about walking through the graph in a systematic way. So we visit every edge, um, you know, uh, make sure we visit every vertex and edge. That way we visit the whole thing part of the graph. We also want to make sure we don't visit too many, any edge or, 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 or vertex too many times. We want this to be efficient. We want this to be linear in the size of the number of edges and the number of, uh, of uh, vertices in the graph. Now, you can model a maze as a graph. Does everybody kind of see? Let's, let's take a look at it. What is a maze? You have probably seen room mazes. I'm going to make one up like this. Hopefully it'll work. Who knows what this is doing? This may not be an interesting maze. But you want to get out here? Uh, let's put some kind of an obstacle over here. Recognize that you can kind of view a maze as a network of edges that you can walk on. And uh, actually, here's where I really could use a colored marker, which I don't got. Um, do people kind of see this? The, the, the dark things are the obstacles. Does everybody see that the channels between obstacles defines a network, a graph, a set of roads, if you wish? We talked about the road network last time. OK? A traversal of getting out of a maze means exploring the maze. If you start in one place over here, 
and you want to end up over here, it involves systematically walking over the edges of the graph, okay? In a way that you don't, you visit everything once or twice, and you don't visit, you know, um, what you call it. You visit everything at least once, and you don't visit anything too many times, okay? Does anybody know I have an algorithm for getting out of a maze? Like, let's say, trying to get to those do that door. Has anyone ever heard of an algorithm for getting out of a maze? Yeah, what is it? Okay, you say kind of put your hand on one of the walls and then just keep walking, right? Does everybody see that if you put your hand on one of the walls and you keep walking, you are not going to systematically visit everything in the graph and you'll get to the outside door because you're visiting every single edge, okay, once, okay, or twice and not repeating things. Or does it seem like with that rule you can get trapped and you are in fact repeating things? Does everybody kind of see that? Does everybody recognize that I'm trapped here? Okay. The right hand rule holds for a special kind of maze. Okay. Turns out it has to have connect connected components. We'll talk about connected components later. Okay. But that illustration is supposed to show you that the traversal is a little subtle. In order to make sure you're not repeating visiting the same place, you're going to have to mark where you have visited. So you'll recognize, hey, I've already been here. Okay? And that's the way that uh, one of the ideas underlying graph traversal. Okay? Any questions? So the thing that makes uh, you get out of mazes is, in fact, uh, a, a general idea, is to keep track of where you have been to make sure you don't visit it too many times. You've probably, I guess, there were the ancient Greek stories about the person who was trapped in the maze and they cleverly left breadcrumbs behind so they could get back, right? Something like that, those kind of stories. Okay? The breadcrumbs you have to leave in the maze, at least when we're doing the kind of graph traversals we're going to do, I'm going to tell you that every vertex in the graph we are going to mark in one of three states. Okay? Every vertex is either undiscovered, meaning we haven't visited it yet. Every vertex is a vertex may be discovered. Discovered means that we have visited it, we have seen it, but we haven't completely ex finished exploring everything going out of it. And the third state in the evolution of a vertex is processed. We have visited all the edge, past edges that go out of this vertex. If we want to explore the graph, we're not going to learn anything else by coming here. It is completely processed. Okay? This is why when we do a traversal, we have a state for every vertex, okay? This is like leaving breadcrumbs, and it's avoiding the kind of cycling that I got into with the previous, uh, with this idea of the right-hand rule. Any questions? So every vertex is going to be in one of three states as a result of our search. It's either going to be undiscovered, discovered, or processed. It should be clear that this is an, an orderly progression. You don't start out discovered and then someone conks you on the head and you're undiscovered. There's an evolution of knowledge in uh, what you know about each vertex. The other key component to doing a traversal of a graph is that uh, we, you, you have to maintain a, a structure of what works still needs to be done. Okay? So initially, what is the story? Initially, you are given a network, and you're given a vertex to start with. 
And you're saying, walk over all the vertices and edges of this graph. If we weren't given a starting point, recognize it's hopeless. Suppose I tell you to walk over all the roads of, the, of some city, but I'm not going to tell you where the city is. I'm not going to tell you where the graph is. That's obviously hopeless. You can't do anything. So you have to have a starting point. Initially, we're starting our search with a single vertex that starts. And when we explore a vertex, if that's our start vertex, we have to gradually look at all the edges coming out of that vertex. If we want to do this in a traversal where we're walking, we want to walk out this edge, do something, maybe explore what's reachable there, maybe come back and look at the second edge. Okay? Or we could explore the first edge, second edge, third edge, all those local edges and store the endpoints in a queue of work, okay, that we need to do, okay? The two things we need in a, as far as data structures for a search, a traversal, is we're going to need to have a, a um, what do you call it? Every vertex is going to have a state. Was it discovered or not? Or completely processed? And we're going to have a, a, a structure of all the vertices that have been discovered but not yet completely processed. Before it's discovered, we don't have any need, we, we don't know it exists, so it can't be on our work queue. After it's been completely processed, we know everything we know about it, need to be known about it, we might as well throw it out. Okay? Any questions? Now, the act of exploring a vertex is going to be taking a look at every edge. If we look at this edge, if we have an edge x, y, notice that if it's an undirected graph, we will explore this edge when we visit x. We will also explore this edge when we visit y. Every edge potentially is going to get walked over twice. Once when we explore X, once when we explore Y. To make sure that we don't do redundant work, we have to make sure that if, if we discover Y from X, we don't later rediscover y, X from Y and start exploring that part of the graph again. That's what the markers on the vertices do. Any questions? Okay. This right now may fall into the category of dull but abstract. Um, and if we do the, the traversal the way I do, where whenever we discover something, we store it on the work to explore further, eventually we're going to discover every vertex of the graph so long as the graph is in one connected piece, okay? If there is a connected piece, uh, is there any way we could not, we started over here at S, is there any way we could not explore that vertex? Well, if we slowly grow out and explore everything, once we discover a neighbor of this vertex, we will add that to the list of vertices to explore, and when we explore its outgoing edges, we're doomed to discover it. The good thing about traversal is, if we do it the way we're doing it now, either breadth first or next class depth first search, we're guaranteed we will discover every vertex, and we're never going to walk over an edge more than twice. Any questions? So, there are two different traversal algorithms we're going to talk about. I think I just mentioned that. Once, one of them is breadth-first search, that's today. The other is depth-first search, and that we'll talk about next class. Now, some of you are maybe saying, why do I want to do a breadth-first search? Okay, 
No one looks like they're paying you to do a bread first search. And that's absolutely right. A bread first search or a depth first search is kind of a component that we're gonna build bigger graph algorithms from, okay? There are um, issues related to shortest paths that bread first search turns out to be good at. Um, what I'm gonna try to do today for the rest of class is carefully go through what bread first search is and then go through a couple of applications of it to other more obvious graph problems, okay? Any questions about that? about my strategy. Okay. What is, how do I implement bread first search? I'm gonna go do an example a little bit sooner after you see the, soon after you see the algorithm, but I want you to kind of understand the code a little bit before I go and show you this. We're gonna need a data structure to maintain what the state of a vertex is whether it is, uh, what you call it, has been discovered, processed, or, uh, and discovered or not. The way I have chosen to maintain the state of a vertex is by using two Boolean arrays. For every vertex, I'm gonna have a Boolean value, has it been processed, and a Boolean value, has it been discovered. So there's processed, and discovered. Initially, both of them are false. Then when I discover the vertex, this is gonna become true. And then when I process the vertex later, that's gonna be true. So that's gonna be the evolution of the state of each vertex. In addition, to um, what you call it, the uh, state of each vertex. I am also going to maintain who was the ver vertex that discovered me. You can kind of imagine on a traversal, you start from one vertex, okay, and you go and explore, explore the first edge out from that. You're going to be going to a vertex that nobody has visited before. You are the discoverer of that, okay? The discoverer of a vertex, we're gonna call the parent. And we are gonna maintain a tree of discovery, okay? How many times can something be discovered? Okay, let's think about it. How many times was, uh, you know, what you call it? Uh, gravitation discovered? can only be really discovered once, right? The first guy to, 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 um, to come up with the thing. Who was the one who discovered America? Well, arguably it was discovered once. Every vertex is going to be discovered once. It will be discovered when exploring the edges out of another vertex. The one that discovered it is its parent. Any questions? The parent relation, as we'll see, can be very useful. Okay, fair enough. So what does breadth first search look like? First, we have to uh, initialize the graph. The data structures, we uh, initialize the search, excuse me, not the graph. We're given a graph. We want to initialize the search, the traversal of that graph. For each of the n vertices, we're gonna to wanna to say it has not been discovered and it has not been processed. And it, since it has not been discovered, it has no parent. Minus one means that, that, that there's no parent for that vertex. Any questions about that? The interesting part of the work, okay, is really here. This is a bread first search. Bread first search says that we are given a graph and we are given a starting vertex. And we want to do that traversal. We are going to have to maintain a data structure of all the vertices that are reached, that we, that we have discovered but haven't finished exploring yet. 
that is good data structure for breadth-first search is going to be a first-in, first-out queue. Okay? So what does breadth-first search look like? We start by initializing the queue of, of work to be done to empty. We then stick the start vertex in there. The start vertex has been discovered, but not yet completely explored. So that's going to be in the queue of work that we still have to do. Then, of course, has, uh, the start vertex, we know about the start vertex, so yes, it has been discovered. Now, what is the flow of the traversal? Let me put that back gently. Uh, let's erase it. What is the flow of the traversal? Well, while the queue is not empty, meaning there is at least some work, some vertices that have been discovered but not completely explored, what are we going to do? We take that vertex V off the queue. Because we're using a queue, which vertex comes off the queue first? The oldest vertex or the youngest vertex in the queue? Oldest, right? So this is processing first in, first out, right? What are we going to do? If we want to do something with this vertex, one thing I have done with my breadth first search to make it useful for applications, I've added some auxiliary routines, process vertex, oops, sorry, process edge, process vertex late. I've added various stubs here, so if you want to do something when you first discover a vertex, okay, you can insert the code here. If you want to do something right before you finish processing the vertex, you can import code here. If you want to do something when you visit the edge once, this is the way, we, way you would put it. My breadth first search imp implementation has these stubs, so you, when you want to build a more complicated algorithm, you're not just walking over the graph for the sake of walking it over. Once you get to the vertex, you might want to do it. Okay? Let's say your job was to paint the graph. Okay? Then what would you want to do when you got to the vertex? You'd like to pull out your brush and paint it, right? Do you want to paint the vertex many, many times? No. You want to try to organize it so that you will paint the vertex, each vertex, only once. If you paint it when, in process vertex early, every vertex is going to get painted once. If you put, paint, paint the edge when you have process edge, every edge will get painted once. That's why we carry the back payload there. Any questions? Okay. What's the guts of the search, though? Okay. Once we have a vertex V, if this is V, we want to look at all the outgoing edges of V. What's the metaphor of that? P, just like I had up there, P is going to point to the head of the list of edges associated with vertex V. I'm assuming my graph is represented as an adjacency list. What is my metaphor here? While the pointer is not null. Okay, meaning that there is at least one edge I have not, I've got, if this is, you know, vertices 4, 7, 3, 6, 9, P points to a list of 4, 7, 3, 6, 9, nil. What am I going to do? Y is what P points to. So initially, y is going to be this, okay? If vertex y is not processed, right? That's what the next line is. What does that mean? It means I have not completely finished exploring it, 
Okay? If Y has not been completely explored, then it turns out that's the signal that, um, what you call it, that this is the first time I have seen edge V comma Y. Recognize, remember, Y is an edge uh, fr from V. If V is not, Y is not processed, that denotes that this is the first time we've seen that edge, let's do something. If we want to do something at the edge, we might as well do it now. There's also some slightly different logic if the graph is directed, but let's not worry about that now. If Y has not been discovered before, then I am the guy that discovered it. V is the vertex that discovered Y. If so, what do we need to do? Well, Y's got to be put on the queue to be fit processed eventually. It's got to be marked that it's been discovered because we just did discover it. And since, uh, since, um, since V was the one who discovered Y, the parent of Y is V. Any questions about that logic? Then what am I going to do? I'm going to keep iterating here. Actually, I guess this doesn't go down that far. This goes over to here. OK? Um, I'm going to keep going through. And for every edge on the adjacency list, add it to the queue if it's being discovered. And if not, just move on. Any questions? OK? And at the end, I have a stub enabling me to visit the vertex late if I want it. Any questions about what this traversal is? This should not be exciting, OK? But you should understand what we're doing and why it's working. Any questions? Let's look what happens when we try to do a traversal of a graph. OK? Does everybody see the graph up top? OK? Is it the thing on the left is my graph. Let me go and try to do a simulation of what, what my data structures are showing me. If I am, um, what you call it, uh, trying to do a, a breadth-first church of this, this graph starting from vertex 1. What is going to happen? First, I need to have, for my vertices 1 through 8, I need to have a state for it. 2, 3, 4, 5, ah, 6, 7, 8, right? And originally, none of these vertices had been discovered. Now, when I got to, say, start at reversal from 1, 1 has been discovered. Does everybody agree? I need to have a queue of work to do. And originally on my queue is only vertex 1. OK? Now, what happens when I explore around vertex 1? OK? I am first going to pull this off my queue and say, go through all the outgoing edges of, of, uh, of 1. I am going to discover vertex 2. Does everybody agree? 2 has not been done before. So what am I going to do? 2 has been discovered. I'm going to add it to my list of work to be done. What other neighbors of mine do I have? Seven. Has seven been discovered before? No, I'm going to mark it as discovered and add it to my queue of stuff to do. Eight. Has eight been discovered before? No, I'm going to add it to my queue, mark it as discovered. Right? Note that 1 just discovered vertices 1 and 2 and 7 and 8 
This thing over here is the tree of discovery as we're building it. What is the next thing I've done? Now I've finished exploring all of this. This is now completely processed. Okay? What is my next job? I'm going to start to explore Vertex 2. Vertex 2 has some edges, right? The first edge is to Vertex 1. Notice Vertex 1 is now completely processed, right? It has already been discovered. So I do not want to add 1 to the queue again, because that work is completely done. Does everybody agree? What's my next edge I'm going to explore? I am going to discover number 3. 3 has been discovered. I am going to go discover number 5. 5 has been discovered. I have now going to go visit 7. 7 has been already previously discovered, right? 7 is now in a state where it has been discovered, but not completely processed. Okay, that's fine. Now I've explored everything out of number 2. Number 2 is now completely processed. Any questions about that? Let's keep doing it. Next thing that I'm going to work on is vertex 7. 7 goes to vertex two, 1. It's been completely processed. 7 goes to vertex 2. It's completely processed. What does that tell me? I didn't learn anything by exploring 7. It has been completely processed. And I'm finished with 7. When I explored two, I discovered these two vertices. Okay? What's the next thing I want to work on? Vertex 8. Vertex 8 has one neighbor. That is vertex 1. It's completely processed. 8 doesn't have anything interesting to tell me. What about vertex 3? Vertex 3... Discovered vertex 4. Good for it. Okay. 4 goes on the list. Okay. 4 goes to 5. 5 has been discovered. Okay. I'm going to explore that edge. Okay. But anything else? I'm done. I'm done with 3. Now I'm going to look at 4. 5. 5 is neighbors to 2, which is processed. 3 which is processed, 4 of which is discovered, 6 of which is not discovered. So 5 is the discoverer of 6, 6 goes here, discovered, okay, 3 has been completely processed, 5 now has been completely processed, and I'm going to start from 4. This edge 4 was first explored when I did the search from 5. 4, there's nothing new to discover. 4 is processed. The last vertex is 6. 6, this edge had already been walked over when I did 5. 6 has been completely discovered, processed. Any questions about it? Do you see how every, because of the data structure, Every vertex went from undiscovered to discovered to processed. Every vertex appeared on my work queue. We tracked the parent of each vertex, which are the, the dark lines here. Okay? The dashed lines here are the other edges, with the arrow showing you when was the first time it was processed. Any questions about what this depth first search is breadth first search is doing? Okay. It shouldn't yet seem exciting to you, but it should seem like a mechanical procedure that will walk over the graph, okay, in a systematic way. Any questions? Okay.
Okej. Okay. Now, what can we do with a graph as we walk over it? Okay? Um, well, like I said, the key to using breadth-first search as a building block of algorithms is to realize that there are these stubs about processing an edge or processing a vertex early or late that are places where you can add code to tell it what you want to do on each vertex. Right now, I have these parameterized to print, just printing out, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm visiting the vertex, I'm visiting the edge. By adding these statements, I'm printing out every edge and every vertex exactly once. Okay? But there are more interesting things to do with a traversal. Any questions? Okay. One thing that's interesting in a graph is if you have an unweighted graph and you want to find the shortest path from any vertex, from V to any vertex, the breadth first search is going to find the shortest path. Why is that? Think about what the discovery thing is. You're starting from some vertex V. What are you doing? You're going to start by visiting all the neighbors of V. Right? If the graph is unweighted, then what does that mean? That means that the shortest possible path to any vertex not V is going to be one edge. Does everybody agree? All the neighbors of V are going to be vertices that are a distance 1 from V. Right? Now, what if I have a vertex, a, a graph, and the shortest path from V to X is 3, like it is here, kabunk, kabunk, kabunk. How would I find that? Well, this vertex here, its parent was V. The parent of A was V. When we explored the neighborhood of this, it discovered B. If it discovered B, when you explored B, it discovered X. What's the shortest path, unweighted path from V to X? If we did a breadth first search from V, the shortest unweighted path from X to V is to follow the chain of parents. Kabunk, kabunk, kabunk. Okay? And walking backwards through these parent pointers gives us the shortest possible path. Any questions about that? Let's take a look at the example. It's, everything with graphs is a lot more subtle than it seems at front first. Let's look at the example here. Here was a graph. Here was the parent relation. What is the shortest path from 1 to 4? Can anybody give me a shortest path from 1 to 4? Does everybody agree that um, you could find a one shortest path from, from 1 to 4? would be to go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 5 to 4. Does everybody agree with that? What is the path that we would discover, if you look at this carefully, from 4? The parent relationship is the parent of 4 was 3, parent of 3 was 2, parent of 2 was 1, that's going to say that if you want to find the shortest path, having done the traversal from 1, the shortest path from 4 was this, this, this. Does everybody see that? That was the path found by this tree of discovery. Okay? Any questions? 
Note, any questions about that? Note that there might be other paths of length three. We said that there was a path from four to five to two to one. That was every bit as short as that other path, right? But every node can have only one discoverer. The discoverer of four was three. So in the breadth first search tree, so uh, the path that we want to recover is going to be this one, not that one. Any questions about that? Do people see this or people don't see it? Okay. So, in some sense, the thing that, that, uh, that um, what you call it, makes breadth first search very special is that it gives you a way to find shortest paths in unweighted graphs. Okay? Any questions? And the way it does it is because in an unweighted graph, every edge has a weight of, let's say, one. We want the smallest number of hops. The smallest number of hops is captured by this breadth first search process, walking backwards through the tree of discovery. Any questions? How can we reconstruct that path? There is a very slick recursive algorithm for finding the shortest path from a vertex given the parent's relation. It is a recursive algorithm. I want you to look at this code, make sure you really understand it. It's recursion. Find path calls find path. What does it say? If you want to find the path, the shortest path starting from the root of your breadth first search, Okay, you want to find the shortest path from start to end. And you're given the parents relation. How do we do it? Well, if start equals end, then we know the shortest path. Does everybody agree with it? What's the shortest path from vertex 1 to vertex 1? Done. Okay. In general, what do we want to say? I want to find what is the shortest, find the path from start to the parent of the end node. Okay? Notice the parent of the end is one closer to, the, to start than end. So what is this recursive algorithm? If start is not equal to end, okay? Find the path from start to the parent of n, print it out, and then print out vertex end at the end. So what is that going to do if we had a, a, a path where there was vertex 1 going to 5, going to 7, going to 3? If this was in the parent's relation, to find the print out the path from 1 to 3, I'm going to ask you first print out the path from 1 to 7 and then print out the 3. To print out the path from 1 to 7, first print out the path from 1 to 5. Then pr print 7. To do that, first find the path from 1 to 1 and then print out 5. The shortest path from 1 to 1 is 5. We pop off the stack, then we print out the 5. Then we print off the 7, then we print off the 3. Make sure you understand how the recursion here works and why it prints the, or, the, the vertices out in the right order. Any questions about that? This is one of these things you've got to sit down and look at the nitty-gritty and make sure you really understand it. Okay? Any questions about how that works? Okay. Once we have really understand the nitty gritty of what breadth first search does, then there's all kinds of interesting applications we can use breadth first search for. 
Meaning, by an application, I mean a real computation you may want to do, okay, on, um, on a graph. Okay? Any questions? The first computation that I would like to try to do is connected components. When you have a graph, okay, you can imagine, let's think of the road network. Is the road network of the world connected? Meaning you can st start in Long Island and drive any place in the world. Is there places you can't drive to from, from Long Island? Can anybody give me the name of a place you can't drive to in Long Island? From Long Island, yeah? Europe. Europe. You can't drive to Long Island from Europe. Why not? Because there's an ocean. There's no road over the ocean. Does everybody agree with that? So if you think about it, if you are trying to build a system for underlying, if you're Google trying to understand the road network of the world, you will note that the road network consists of logical pieces. Sorry. Uh oh, trouble. Um, There's a lot of roads connecting places in New York. In the United States, there are a lot of places connecting in New York. There's no connection between these two pieces. A common problem in graph algorithms, the first, let's say, interesting problem in a graph algorithm, is given a graph, tell me how many pieces the graph has. Each piece we will call a connected component. Okay. The Jewish star is a, the star of David, can be thought of as a graph on six vertices. Does everybody see that? How many pieces are there of that graph? How many connected components are there? Two. Does everybody see that? Can you look at that from a distance and tell that it's two? Recognize it's, it's not completely trivial to tell that there are two pieces from that, right? If I stored this graph in a computer, I would give this maybe vertex numbered one, two, three, four, five, six. How can I take a graph and find all connected pieces of it, okay? This is a fundamental problem in all networks. Okay? Asking, is there a way to get from any one point of this graph to any other point of the graph? Okay? Is something you want to add, know whenever you, someone gives you graph data. And there are more interesting problems. Okay? Like, for example, if you have a game or a puzzle, in Rubik's Cube, how do you know that if you, someone gives you a cube, they say, go ahead and solve it. You start twisting this thing. How do you know that there is a way to solve it? Okay? Again, if there was a way to solve it, you could imagine that there was a graph where every vertex represented a possible state of a, vertex, of a Rubik's Cube. And um, there was an edge between any two configurations you could get to with a single twist. If that was true, the question of, is the Rubik's Cube graph connected in one piece, means is it possible to reconstruct any configuration of Rubik's Cube? My understanding is that that's not actually true. That actually there are kind of, if, if you take the, these stickers and you put them on, on in a different way, there may be no way to solve it, okay? So if you just take a Rubik's Cube and you color the stickers, put stickers on it, the right number of colored stickers in places, there are configurations you can't reach from the solved cube. So that's a good way to frustrate your roommate if, you know, they're a Rubik's Cube solver, okay? Any question? These things reduce to, is a, a graph connected, okay? 
How can we use breadth first search to tell if a graph is connected? Okay. Again, connectivity may sound like it's too elementary a problem to be, uh, to be um, you, know, uh, you know, interesting. The truth is connected components is, a, is an important thing to want to compute. How would we go about computing, telling whether a graph is, is in one piece or not? Any ideas of what the strategy is? Basically, what happens if we start doing a depth first search, a breadth first search in the road network around, let's say, this building on campus? We start here. When we did breadth first search, we're going to explore every vertex and every edge in this connected component, right? We're guaranteed that breadth first search will do it. If we do a breadth first search from here, are we going to discover anything in Europe? The answer is no. If you know that there are n vertices in the graph, okay, six for the case of the Star of David, God knows how many million for Google's road network. If you start from one vertex and you visit all of its neighbors, okay, and keep doing the traversal, either you're going to visit all the vertices or you're going to finish all the vertices you ever visited are now marked completely processed. But if you visited less than n of them, then the graph cannot be connected. Okay? Any questions? So what is the algorithm to find all the connected pieces of a graph? Okay, which come to think of it, I think is, is, is on part of your next homework assignment. So pay, pay attention in that regard. What is it going to do? What if I have a graph G, I loop through all vertices of the graph. I initialize the search only once outside the loop. Okay? So initially, every vertex is marked undiscovered. Now what am I going to do? For i goes from 1 to the number of vertices, if i has not been discovered before, well, then I am at the first vertex of a new connected component. I'm going to start my, at vertex i and do a breadth first search. And I'm going to print out all the vertices I discover. Those are going to be all the vertices in the same component with i. Over the course of that traversal, if these were my vertices, initially every one of them was undiscovered. I will start by starting at vertex. If I start at vertex 1, this is going to be discovered and eventually processed. Discovered and processed, discovered and processed. If this was the component of I, those three vertices will be discovered and processed. The entry for the second vertex will not change. If so, then when I loop for an I equals 2, vertex I has not been discovered. I'm going to start a new search from there. Okay? And... This is going to enable me, I'm going to try doing a depth first search, a breadth first search from every vert undiscovered vertex in the graph. Okay? And therefore I am going to eventually visit every single vertex in every single component. Any questions about that? Okay? Let's see if we understand this. Suppose I have a graph here where I'm doing a breadth first search on, okay, a depth first search on. It has n vertices and m edges. What is the running time of breadth first search on a graph of n vertices and m edges? 
Okay, I start from one vertex of my graph. Here's my graph, ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. I start from one vertex V. It's got N vertices and M edges. If I'm doing a breadth first search on this, what is the running time big O wise of breadth first search? Let's go back to the algorithm and look at it. This is an important thing to know. What is the running time of this algorithm? Yeah? You say it is O of N. Okay? Why do you say it's O of N? You're visiting every vertex at most once, and what if the graph you had had n squared edges? Does everybody agree that every, the complete graph, every vertex is connected to every other vertex, right? If you have a graph with n vertices and n squared edges, you really think you can walk over the whole thing without visiting every edge? What if you don't like that? What if I have a little piece hanging out over here, right? How are you going to discover it? You're going to start from here. Discovered, 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 discovered. I've discovered almost everything, right? But this one hasn't been processed, so let's go. Discovered. Oh, no, 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 no. Didn't discover anything. Didn't discover anything. Does everybody see that the cost of walking out through this graph is not order n? Okay, because you also have to walk over every edge. I thought you were walking over every edge twice. Is that right? Once edge XY was getting walked over from X to Y, it's also getting walked over from Y to X, right? But it's not getting walked over three times. Okay? So what is the complex or the running time of breadth first search? You're going to say what? N times N? N times M? Well, I don't believe it's N times M. Because how many edges were there here? There were N vertices. There's a total of M edges. Am I visiting every edge every time I visit a vertex? No, I'm only visiting the edges that are adjacent to that vertex. You want to try again? What's the running time of this thing? Anybody else? What's the running time of this? Yeah? N plus M. If I have a graph that is very sparse, okay, what is my search going to be? I'm going to start from here. I discover this edge. This has to be done. I'm going to walk over the edge again this way. Start over here. Discovered something. Walk back, discover something. This would take n vertex discoveries plus a total of m edges, each of which got walked twice. If the graph is sparse, this is going to average b. If the number of edges is linear in n, this is going to be linear in n. If we have a very dense graph where m was equal to n squared, then the number of edges we visit is going to dominate what we're doing. Okay? This now is an important thing. Do people see why breadth first search is going to be n plus m running time? What are we doing? For every vertex, this outer while loop, 
is going around how many times? Okay, this is going to be a little tricky to analyze. How many times is this uh, while loop going around? Can anybody tell me how many times that while loop is going to go around? Where we're dequeuing vertices in the search? How many times? N. How many times is this loop going through? I now have another loop where for vertex V, I'm going to look at all of its outgoing neighbors. How many times does this while loop go around? This is a crux of something interesting, so or subtle, so you've got to pay attention here. How many times does it go around? Yes? You're saying what? It goes around proportional to the degree of that vertex. That degree of that vertex could be as big as what? What's the biggest it could be? N. What's the le littlest it could be? One or zero, okay? So what this is taking is the degree of V. Now, how do we analyze that? I know you want to say, okay, a, a something of degree V is nested within something of size N. The way we're used to doing our analysis, you might have said, well, N times at most n is n squared. And you'd be right. This is at most n squared, right? But you're missing this, the interesting case, which is the sparse graphs, right? What is this saying? This I claim, the innermost loop is not going to go. Another way to put it is that the amount of time this is going to go through is for all v from 1 to n, it's the sum of the degrees of v. Does everybody agree with that? For every vertex, we're going to explore all the outgoing edges of it. For vertex 1, it's degree of 1. Vertex 2, the degree of 2. Dot, 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 up to vertex n. The total amount of work here is what? The sum of the vertex degrees. Now the, uh, the $64 question, what is the sum of the vertex degrees of a graph? Okay, you. M, if we want to do it precisely, you're sort of, you're right in a big O sense, what's the actual number, yes? Two times N. Every vertex edge contributes, edge ij adds 1 to the degree of i and 1 to the degree of j, right? This thing is equal to 2 times m. This stuff up here, the total work is n. The sum of all the stuff in here over all n calls is going to be 2 times n. Breadth first search is n plus m. This is something you have to, have to, have to see. If you don't see this, you're going to have a miserable life in graph algorithms. Any questions about that? Yes? What is the idea here? Okay. Recognize that when we've been analyzing algorithms, because we, you guys have, again, originally you didn't like the big O notation. But the big O notation was your friend because you could be nice and sloppy about things, right? You're used to saying, I see two nested loops. The total amount of work is at most the number of times the first one goes around times the, number, times the second one goes around. So as a big O upper bound, actually I'm just put a theta there. As a big O, n squared would have seemed right. Because you've got two loops, both of which can go around n times. But let's be a little bit more careful. This loop does not always go around n times. This loop goes around, when it's called with vertex v, this loop goes around degree of v times. Do all vertices in the graph have the same degree? 
If we want to count the total amount of work, what do we got to do? We got to add it up over all the different subunits, right? So what is the sum of the degree of V in any graph? What is the sum of all the degrees? Yeah? The number of edges? Not the, almost the number of edges. Recognize every edge contributes two things to every, two things to degrees. Edge XY adds one to the degree of X and one to the degree of Y. So what is the sum of this, these degrees going to be equal to exactly? They didn't hear that. What was it? Two times M. And the total time for breadth first search is two, is order N plus M. Why do I say N plus M? What if I give you, say, do a breadth first search of the social network of the hermit society? This is the friendship graph of the hermit society, where nobody has any friends, right? There are N people in this graph. How long would it take to do breadth first search on them? Well, you visit every edge, vertex, and then every one of these loops you go through has nothing in it. It's always, the neighbors are always nil. This would take N work. Does everybody agree? In this case, the number of vertices is more than the number of edges. On the other hand, if you have the party machine society, everybody is a friend of everybody else. Now you walk over this graph. Each of the n vertices has degree n minus 1. Then this would be an n squared computation because m is order theta of n squared. Okay? What's great about breadth first search is that, um, what you call it? The, uh, it's, line it's linear in the edges and vertices. If the graph is sparse, that means it's theta of n. Okay? If the graph is dense, well, you've got to visit all the edges. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Any questions about this? Okay? Question, because I'm going to throw you a curveball in a minute if you don't ask a question. Okay? Okay. Make sure you understand this. Take a picture if you want. This is something you need to know. If the graph is connected, it's clearly going to be order n plus m. Okay? But what happens when we get back to the connected components thing? Let's clear this, clean this up. What is the running time of this algorithm? To find all the connected components of a graph. Remember, what does that mean? We had a world where we had road networks. They were in distinct pieces, right? A total of n vertices and m edges. What is the running time of this algorithm? Okay, let's think about this. Let's analyze it first in the sloppy big O way that we are used to thinking about it. How many times does the outer loop go around? How many times? N. How much time does it take to do a breadth first search from each vertex? What's the, amount of, what's the running time of that breadth first search?